if you think you are and you've got a side hustle or a hobby business, the only way for you to truly understand whether or not you've got the chops to be an entrepreneur is to do it all full time. Yeah. The moment you change and get out of the side hustle, you know, hobby business mindset, the chance you have to actually become a true entrepreneur and feel that fear and do it anyways, you got to get out there and push hard. Welcome to the High Voltage Business Builders, a show where we interview entrepreneurs growing and scaling their income through e-commerce and showing you the path to make your first or next million. Hey folks, welcome back. So this is an interesting change of format today. For the next 25 minutes, I have been asked to be interviewed by Don. So in reverse, why Don is here today is to do a slight flip on the format, if you will. And he is actually going to ask me questions on my podcast that I have to answer. So I get to be in the hot seat today. Don, what are you going to go easy on me? Or are you going to make this hard? Or, or what are we going to what are we going to dig up from the you know what? I think like, is this just a cry episode? Am I going to be crying by the time we're done with this? <laughs> I don't think so. When I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Okay. You know what I, I was thinking, Neil, is that, you know, I know you as a very successful business person, helping a lot of Amazon sellers grow their businesses. And I know that you've done this for yourself as well. And a lot of people I know in the industry know you and respect you for that. Thank you. But I don't think anybody knows your story. And so hopefully today we'll get your story and everybody that works with you, does business with you, thinks about doing business with you, should listen to this and watch it and learn who Neil is. Oh, well, we, we might get some crying done at the end of this. I don't know. We'll <laughs> you may get bits and pieces of my story throughout different podcasts, but it sounds to me like we'll get down yeah. to the nitty gritty on this one. Um, we'll get some things yeah, differently. Different in the, yeah. Let's see how good you can pry so, out of me, questions out of me. Well, let's get started. You ready? Let's do it. Bring it on. All right. Well, you know, I know you're in Missouri, but yeah. did you grow up in Missouri? Where did you grow up? Tell, tell us about yeah. the town that you grew up in. What was it like? Well, this is a strange conundrum because everybody, you know, I can say I'm a Missouri native and I can actually mean it, but I didn't spend the majority of my life in Missouri. I was actually born in Missouri up in Independence. When I was two, my parents lived in Lee Summit. Ha little... Harry Truman. Harry Truman. Harry Truman. Yep. yep. Parents were in Lee Summit. I was born at the Independence Hospital up there. Very shortly wow. after that, they decided to follow some family to Oregon. On the way, they stopped in Arizona huh. for a while near Flagstaff, Arizona. Sorry, let me show that off. And in Flagstaff, we stayed there for just a little bit of time before my dad actually went ahead of us to Oregon and applied for a position at 3M. His background allowed him to be in the mechanical side of things from his tours of two tours in Vietnam in the Navy. And he had a background in mechanical stuff. And so he got into a position and we all followed him up there. So and by the time I was three, I grew up in Oregon. So the better part of my life was spent there growing up until about 18, 19 when I left for college. Where in Oregon? Southern Rogue Valley. If you're familiar with Oregon at all, you know, it's kind of a I-5 corridor, if you will. There's not a whole yeah. lot if you veer off to the west or east coast. If you stick on I-5, you end up with Medford right above the Oregon border. You get Ashland, Medford, and then you go up from there in Springfield, and then you get up to Portland near the top of Oregon and Washington. So I grew up in the Southern Row Valley. It was known for growing you know, pears and apples and wine. Harry and David is headquartered there. Oh, wow. Very, Interesting. Yeah, very cool stuff from there. And so we got to play in the valley there that also led to the mountains. So we were encompassed by mountains in the Rogue Valley. And it was a fun place to grow up. So what would you do as a, as a kid? You know, I grew yeah. up in, in Brooklyn and then Long Island. Okay. So we were on bikes yeah. out all day yeah. and going to net games just with our friends and on subways no and crazy things like that. What did you do? Well, not exactly like that, although I lived in a cul-de-sac. <laughs> I, okay. you know, when, when I was growing up, we'd get on our bikes and we'd spend the whole day outside. Mom wouldn't necessarily know where we were. We'd be riding around. Same here. We'd be out with friends. We'd be beyond the cul-de-sac. We'd be wherever. So we would play until we got a little older, until I could start driving and stuff. At that point, it was, you know, day trips or weekend warrior trips up the mountains where yeah, we could literally wow. go, you know, an hour from there up to six or 7,000 feet. And you would be in either snow or cold, or you could go on the lakes. We would camp, we'd go cross country skiing. And I never actually got really big into downhill, although there's some really great Mount Ashland skiing just above us mm -hmm. where it's really fun for downhill, but we did the snowmobiling and the tubing in the winter and we did cross country skiing and we got to do on some sled dogs. That was fun. And then the, it was mountain biking and hiking and trail running during the, the winter, spring and into summer months. Yeah. But again, the climate's changed a little bit there enough that it's been a really dry climate. For me growing up, eight months of it was wet. The other three months was super dry. So we just, you know, balanced out a lot, a lot of wet weather, fun activities uh, like yeah. camping and stuff. We used to joke every time we go camping it would rain. And so we'd always pack for rain. 
uh, no matter when we went camping because we would do that. So we got to spend a lot of time on the coast because Oregon in the split there, if you go about three hours west, you hit the coast. So we would go maybe four hours. I have to remember this. Three or four hours, I'm going to say. Someone will correct me. To get to the coast, but there was a lot of fun on the coast from dune buggies to riding the quads to just, you know, being a part of the sea life, going to the Umpqua Lighthouse and camping on the coast and doing crabbing out there on the docks. I was going to ask, did you go crabbing? Crabbing on the docks because every year we'd go out there with family in August and we'd all spend a a week camping all around each other. And then we would go crab, the crab festival there, they'd throw a crab out with a dot on the back. And this was in a Winchester Bay area, a beautiful little area just off the coast where they bring in the daily harvest and you can get fish and seafood and everything that day. And then we'd go crab and try to catch that crab because it was a a $3,000 pot. So we'd take uh, some food and stay out there until dark, and then we'd be out there crabbing until the late evening. Didn't win it. Never caught that sucker. <laughs> that was always the elusive crab. But I yeah. grew up in, and it was a rural area. It was a hardworking town at that point. It wasn't really where it is now, which was more of the, you know, traveling, I-5, a lot of tourism. Yeah. But when I grew up, it was a hardworking logging town, a lot of blue collar, a lot of effort, a lot of things and, and just stuff to do with really wonderful people. And it was just a fun place to grow up as a kid. Just an amazing place. It sounds like it. It sounds like, it, and you talk about it, like you just said, it's a great place to grow up. It sounds like you just really loved I did. the way you grew up and the, the people that were there and yeah, the whole bit. Absolutely it's, did. It's the way it should be, man. That's the way it should be. Everybody's probably what like, about well, why did you leave? <laughs> yeah, well, we're going to get to that. <laughs> why did you leave such an amazing place? <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. But what about siblings? Well, I have one sister. She actually lives near me now. She took a roundabout trip in life and, and got married to a guy who is from Florida, and then about two years ago, we were just figuring this out yesterday. She moved out here near us in the Ozarks, and they live about 25 minutes from us now, maybe 30 minutes or so from us now. That's great. Yeah. That's great. We get to see so I was going to ask you about sports and mm-hmm. activities yeah. outside, but you know, you just said skiing, cross-country skiing, yeah. hiking, yep, mountain biking, all, all these you know, He-Man type things <laughs> not, out, not, out, not, out not in the mountains. Really. <laughs> it, more We're adventure about, enthusiasts, you know, kind of things. It sounds great. What about organized sports? Yeah, you know, so I got into that a little bit in the later eighth grade and ninth grade and played for a bit. I was never good enough to be on like the JV or the full team. So I played in like the JV scrum team, which was fun. Got to do some JV games and played for most of my high school, if you will, career. One of the things. What sport? Basketball. So I was one of the, at my age, I was one of the taller guys. I was six foot four by the time I got to my senior year. So I got to be center in the scrum team, which was fun. And we played a lot of games and we'd, we'd work out three hours a day and we'd lift oh, and play ball all the time. When I was not in other that's activities, great. I was playing basketball. That's great. Yeah, I was football, lacrosse, and baseball. And when I played basketball, the coach would put me on the center of the other team. Right. <laughs> and, my, and my job, because I was kind of a tough kid, yeah. and my job was to be on the center who would always be killing us because they were always you know much larger than all of us yeah. and could score many points was to keep the ball away from this guy at all costs. At all costs, even so, if you got fouled out. Uh, I fouled out of every game. Right. <laughs> that, was your, that was your mission. <laughs> that was my mission. Yeah. The whole goal was to keep him from touching the ball. Okay. And I would do that. And by the end of the game, most games, he would, you know, be frustrated to the point where he'd take a swipe at me. And, you know, Technicals. Every game ended in a fight. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> so you're a scrapper, is that what you're saying? You know, uh, they put me in what I, what, I, what I could be doing basketball. I wasn't a scorer. I should have so, played football, so, although, you know, honestly, you know, being the size I was, football probably would have been a great sport for me. But I was growing so fast, literally, in those three years, the first three years of high school, that I had a lot of knee problems. I was, I was uh, growing so fast, I had gaps in my knees, and so I had to wear supports on my knees and stuff to keep the pounding from happening. Yeah. But I, I heard a lot of cartilage in my knee, and, and eventually that caused problems with my knees because I grew so fast, and I played every day through that. It created a lot of aches and pains and, and problems with my knees. To the point that eventually when I played a pickup game of intramural football in my first year of college, I broke my you know ACL, tore my ACL in a pickup game of football. And that was kind of the end of that. Uh, yeah, that's so much not damage good. I had to get it reconstructed. So that was that's probably, not good. Yeah. And that's probably good. I didn't play a lot of football. I did enough pounding on my knees up and down the court every day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's brutal. Anyways. It was terribly brutal so, for me anyways. Yeah. So why did you leave such a beautiful place in right? Oregon? Well, to go to another beautiful place in the Ozarks. I have an amazing relationship with my parents now. They literally live a stone's throw up the hill on five acres. That's we great. cut the hilltop off and they had an Amish crew build their house up there. And it's amazing. 
But when I was younger, we had a lot of troubles. There was some disagreements with them and my sister and stuff, and it didn't make for the most comfortable household. And, you know, that was a, that was one of those indicators to me later on in life that, you know, I kind of wanted to get away from all that. And you know, I really wanted to see and I couldn't really stay. And I wanted to see the world. Quite honestly, I had my sights setting on being a fighter pilot. And, and it's funny, I actually went to lunch with my dad last week. He's 80. And we go out at least we try to go out a lot. We haven't been for a while due to the sickness and stuff. But we're getting better. And I got him back out to lunch last week. And he had told me that what you know, I'd asked him a question. Hey, what do you, you know, what did you want to be when you grew up? Like I'd never asked my dad that question, and he's eighty, and I was yeah. like, I asked my dad, like, what did you want to be when you grew up? I like, grow up, etc. Whatever the proper phrase is, and he said, you know, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And I'm like, did I? Oh like, wow, did I get that from him? Did I hear him say? I'm like, did you ever tell me that? Because I do not remember, in all honesty, you ever telling me that. And he's like, I don't think I've ever told anybody that. And I'm like, no kidding. He goes, because that's what I wanted to do. See, my dad had worked a lot during that time frame. He was on third shift. So most of the time, you know, during the day, I wouldn't see him. I'd barely see him at dinner before he went to shift. And then I wouldn't see him in the morning before school. So he was gone yeah. a lot. So either on weekends or when we went on trips and stuff, you know, we were always going and doing some things. So I never had a really great interpersonal relationship. It wasn't that he wasn't there. It wasn't that he was a great yeah. provider and showed me work ethic and all these amazing things about him. He just wasn't around all the time, you know, cause he was right. gone working a lot. And so I just didn't have time to get a relationship with my dad. Uh, yeah. not at the level I think you definitely have now. Long story short, I just wanted to take on the world. I was going to go be a fire pilot. I was ready to leave. I was ready to bust out of that. And by the time I got to the qualifications park, they're like, sorry, you're too big. You can't fit in the cockpit. You're you can't big. be a fighter pilot. You're too at big. That point, it was like, you can't be a fighter pilot. And I'm like, well, crap. So my fallback wow. position was college. And so I was applying to colleges anywhere as far away as I could go just to get out of this, you know, life, just to get away and get, you know, set my feet, move, yeah. you know, change it up. And I got a full, nearly full ride music scholarship, plus some compensation from a lovely family member who helped with part of it. And I had a work study I had to obligate to make sure those things were part of it. So in essence, I had a free ride to college. So I took That's it. great. And it was a small liberal arts college in the South corner, if you will, of Iowa before you, right before you reach the Missouri border. So I ended up in Iowa for college. Graceland. Oh, you went to Graceland. I right? did. Graceland was a college at that point, and they call it a Graceland University now. Uh, yeah. And I had gone there on music scholarship. So I was there to do music composition and, and, you know, be a musician, whatever that means exactly. I don't really think I had an idea what that meant. I had just played music since the fourth grade. I played trumpet. I did very well. I went to Allstate in Oregon and, and got scholarships. Wow. And so that was what I planned to do in college. Very cool. So do you know how a musician and park bench are different? No. A park bench can support a family of four. Yeah. <laughs> That's so true. I always, <laughs> I always joke that I'd literally be living in a van down by the river if I continued <laughs> that because there was no real end to that. The same joke I, is that literally that would be cool today. Yeah, you know, that'd be awesome and, and trendy. But back then it was like the ultimate failure, like you're bombed out of school and living in a van by the river. The end result was I didn't want to be in college. So I failed out multiple times. First time I failed out, I had to reapply. Honestly, I did great in high school. Like I was, you know, 3.8 GPO, 4.0. I got plenty of good stuff in, in high school. It was relatively easy for me. College, I never did actually learn how to study. So college for me was tough. It was tough because I didn't want to be there. I didn't know what to do. And I really didn't want to apply myself anyways. So I never really learned what to do. So by the second year, I'd failed out. They reinstated me once and said if I failed out again, they'd have to expel me. The second time I failed out, I actually got reapplied because I went to the president only because of a situation with one of the professors and I butting heads in which he overstepped too far and you know physically, physically threatened me with violence and threw things at me. And because of that, I got reinstated, but I didn't want to be there. So I just did that because yeah. there was nothing better to do and I wasn't sure what to do, so I just got reinstated. <laughs> Because I, I was just causing trouble. And I'm sure this guy was mad at me for legitimate reasons because I was being a jerk. So the end result was the internet showed up, you know, green screens and, you know, three letter green yeah. screens hit the I for inbox and type and stuff had suddenly evolved into Windows and Pentium computers. And I'm like, okay, I want to be a part of this. Like, how do I get involved in this somehow? Everyone was like, well, you can go technical track. You can learn the computers. You could learn the networking. At this point, you know, very quickly, Microsoft was starting to put out certifications and things that you could get yep. to try to be certified. And I'm like, ah, man, I just don't want to go the technical route. That just doesn't vibe with me. Like in music and stuff, it was about free flowing. And I love the... I love the classical and creative, but the jazz was my favorite. Like I love jazz and Wynton Marsalis and Dizzy Gillespie. And I just, I listened to this stuff all the time and playing jazz was so much fun because I could be creative. I could be me. I could create something that no one had heard. 
And so business for me was in, in the idea of all this and a structured track of anything, go this way, get certified, do this. Right. It's the 180 degrees opposite of my brain. So I didn't fit into academia, so I jumped and I went into the corporate world. I started consulting with a little company out of Blue Springs, Missouri. I taught myself HTML programming on the side while I was helping them network computers and banks because I knew how to do that Very cool. days during the university where we literally learned how to do that from the computers they just bought on how to yep. network them at the university level. And because I had that skill set, I got that little job and, and then I taught myself programming and I learned active server pages at that point, which was Microsoft Tech and got good enough that I applied to a consulting firm called Maxim at Sprint. It was a contract job with Sprint in Kansas City. I got the contract. So I suddenly went from unemployed to making 25 bucks an hour. So I was you know, pretty happy with that. And yeah. uh, took off contracting in Sprint's local supply chain, building a knowledge management system, which no one had ever really done before. And we were building a way to combine all this corporate knowledge into one database and be able to have people search on it. So this was all new. I was literally learning how to do that on the fly from what I knew that I taught myself. And so it literally became an understanding of it's who you know that gets you there and what you know that keeps you there. So I literally went home in the evenings, would study the things I did not know and come back and apply them the next day and got pretty good at it pretty fast. Spent almost a year contracting with them and had some really good success. We launched the first knowledge management system inside Sprint's local tele, uh, telco, and that gave me some of the accolades necessary to go apply for a new company called Sprint PCS. It was pulled Never heard of them. from local and teleco, and they were starting a PCS mobile division to try to be one of the first to the market. And so I was part of the first division of PCS, the 5,000th employee-ish. I remember my badge number. Wow. And so I got to go be a full-time employee. So they hired me on benefits and everything else. I was 21 and I was making 60,000 a year. And wow. So was, what year was this? This would have been in 2000. Wow. Yeah. 2000. Yeah. Wow. 2000 ish. 60 grand in 2000. That's pretty good. So all of a sudden, yeah, I'm making as much as my dad was. And so life all of a sudden had a different perspective. You know, now with buying cars and getting into debt and doing stupid stuff with money. So that didn't turn out exactly, extremely well in the long run, but I was, you know, running a team of people and we were launching the first technical division of support for knowledge management to support the launch of the mobile phone. So I was just expanding on what I'd already done. At this point, it was more business than technical because the team was handling that. I was more of the business. They brought in an outside contractor to help implement a new knowledge management system. And we worked with the team to implement that at a larger scale. We did that twice during my five years at Sprint, supporting the growth of what was 2,500 reps when I signed on and the 5,000 employees they pulled together. In five years, there were 25,000 reps and 80,000 employees. So I got to oh, watch wow. massive hyperscale growth. I got to stay on the inside of that implementation team through that entire growth. Still hadn't got my degree. Didn't go back and take advantage of the corporate, you know, get your degree stuff because really I didn't yeah. get it at that point. I was just too busy, you know, dealing with people and large projects and lots of money inside that company. And so I used that as just experience and made a lot of connections. And again, learning who it was that I should be a part of and who I needed to know was more important than what I knew. And I held, it sure that, is. held that all the way until IBM showed up with a team of consolidated 400 people to help launch this next thing for Sprint. The project team there and some really great partners from IBM came in. They were flying in every week. I was stuck there in Kansas doing this project. And I thought, man, that would be so sexy if I could get on. And, you know, get my cell phone, my laptop and start traveling and being that, you know, management consultant person. And I just saw the next evolution of this coming forward and got to be good friends with one of the partners, a genuine friend who's still a friend today. His name's Peter. And Peter cool. gave me a hand up and he said, hey, there's a position inside this group. You got to go to our month to interview for it. And if you get it, you know, you'll come back and work here. And I did. I flew out to our monk. It literally was set up. It was a 15 minute conversation. Uh, and just so everybody knows, Armonk is in New York. Armonk, New York. Just north of the city. That's yeah. right. So it was my first trip into the city. I was still too young at that point to rent a car. I had to get approval because at, at 25 and under, you could not rent a car without approval. So I was still traveling right. <laughs> with approval slips in order to even rent a car, which sounds stupid, but there you go. And so I rented that car out of New York City. And, and it was, there's a strange thing with New York, you've, your first time there and you're trying to do business and you're extremely green. I mean, it was why it was wild experience, right? I think they were playing, I believe they were playing a joke on me, but it turns out to be true. So I get this rental car, I mean, you go in this door and you go up these stairs and it's this dumpy building and you're like, where am I going? Like, and there's this half, you know, sign kind of flickering called Hertz. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm in the right place. And you go into the doors and there's just a guy sitting at a table and it's an, it's an open area. There's cars everywhere. And it looks like the fifth floor of this building. Right. 
And I go in there to get the car rental and stuff. And the guy, and I'm thinking, you know, this guy's going to kill me. Like I'm in this dark, you know, building. I went up the, yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty sure I'm in the right in place for all I know. I could be, you know, getting set up, right. Getting, you know, kidnapped and being put on a television later. But the guy in New York. Yeah, I'm in New York. Well, I didn't know. I was so fascinated. I was so excited to get to all the things I that I wanted to get to while I was there. But I show up and totally green on the street. And the guy's like, okay, yeah, you know, you got your car, got your reservation. I was feeling a little better when I saw the paperwork and stuff. And he goes, okay, you need to go over here and, and you're going to meet Blackie and you're going to get your car. And I was like, okay. And, and I was looking around. He's like, yeah, over there. Just ask for Blackie and you'll get it. So I go over there and there's a group of black guys. And I'm like, oh no, this guy is setting. Like I was, my, I was like, this guy is setting me up. This can't be true. So I'm like, here's my paperwork and stuff. And, and sure enough, there was a guy there, six foot six, just built like a tank. His name was Blackie. He was the nicest oh, guy man. ever. But I felt so set up in there, like I'm going to walk in there and be like, hey, where's Blackie? Yeah. <laughs> like that was like perfect, you know, uh, the next level of death in New York. Anyways, long story short, yeah. I get up there, I do the thing and, you know, everything is good. Didn't get kidnapped. No one killed me. Get in there, got the interview. 15 minutes later, walk out and I'm an IBM. So now I'm a full-time IBM badged employee and it's time to get my laptop and all procurements. Got my MX card. By that time I'm 26 and they're like, you can travel, no problem. And started a new adventure. And IBM spent white IBM. shirt, black suit, black tie. No, we the this whole was the no? moved version of IBM. This wasn't the G man oh. men of black kind of stuff. This was, okay. uh, you know, business casual travel attire all the time everywhere you went. But it was laptop, cell phone, and a credit card and travel all the time. And yep. so that was fun for a few years until it got a little old. <laughs> yep. Until the travel I got the, the last year before I, I left IBM, the second year, the, the next year I, I finished out and then left, I traveled almost 200 days that year. And so I was like pretty oh, much done with that. Man, yeah. were you married at that time? No, I was actually in between. I had gotten that arrogant, prideful 20 year old, uh, 21 year old kid into a marriage that should never have really happened in the first place. But hey, life is what it is. Honestly, where it I'm is. at now, I would never have changed that if I could go back and tell myself, I would just say, stick it out, man. You just, you're going to like how this hit. Right. But I got myself into a marriage with a girl who I think honestly didn't want to be married to me. And I didn't really know what I want. And I thought I loved a girl that was there, but I really wasn't seeing things for what they were. Long story short, about six years later, we ended in a divorce that was pretty nasty. Had to start over completely, had to give up everything. And the you know I had a little side hustle business in, in game servers that I had been running. Okay. Uh, we yeah. were running about 20 game servers. This was kind of a pre-sprint into Sprint slash IBM thing. I just kind of kept running on the side, always thinking at some point it might make enough money for me to just go do that. But anyway, that was I, like your first entrance into entrepreneurship. True there. entrepreneurship. Yes. People billing, customer support, all that stuff was being handled. And, you know, I was actually building a company and, and a, a path, I thought, to leave in the corporate world. Anyways, I had to give that all up in the divorce. <laughs> I had to shut the whole thing down. That was nasty. And then got down to nothing and had to give up the bank accounts and the 401k and got to debt and everything and literally walked away with a car I didn't own and a few things in the back of the car and completely restarting my life from scratch. Ooh. So it was reinvent time because I didn't know what I wanted to do really still. I knew IBM yeah. was fun. I enjoyed it. The people were great. I loved the work. And that was my you know, life-saving thing because at that point, I literally packed everything in a suitcase, parked the car in long-term parking, and then just flew. I would fly every week. I'd be in a different hotel. I'd spend the weekends in a different location at another hotel. Right. And for a long time, I was just a road warrior by its most, what do you want to say, succinct by measure. Definition. I was literally not coming home to yeah. anything every weekend. I was going somewhere else. Uh, Got it. A suitcase. So that was a time I needed to refocus my life, refigure out who I was, learn from my mistakes that I had made and the things that I wanted to change and ran across a, a literally a, a lady who ended up being a, a very good friend of mine due to a mutual relationship and got introduced to her only to find out later on, I would wake up and realize I was in love with this girl. Yeah. It turns out she was in love with me too, which is cool. So that we, helps. Yeah. It helped too. She was actually in love with me. So it was easier to get married when I, <laughs> when yeah, I realized yeah, we were that's both great. really in love with each other. Not just one of us. And so long story short, you know, I, I needed that time. I wasn't married to your point and we didn't have children. And so when I got to the end of that, by the time we were going to get married in 2007, IBM basically came to me in, in February near my birthday of all times and said, hey, we're going to be letting your position go. You need to move to another division. You're going to have to downgrade and start at a different position or try to get into one if you're lucky or we're going to move you to Argentina. And I said, oh. well, Argentina is not on my docket. I'm not really interested in Argentina because I'm going to get married and... So they're like, well, by June, you'll be out. So you'll figure it out. So I got early retirement from IBM in 2007 and said, okay, let's make a run at it. So I got married in March to this lovely girl named Katie. She's from Oklahoma. 
and we got married in March. And by June, we were, I was, you know, free agent <laughs> uh, looking for my next step. Not really sure what to do. She was a, she had graduated from a BSN and an RN. She's a nurse. Huh? So she was working in home health and loving that. And she had found her place and we had moved Beautiful. to Colorado for a while, which was fun. So came from Iola to Kansas city for about 12 years and then left when she graduated and we went to Colorado and spent almost a year living just south in Colorado. So we were having a lot of fun with that. I was mostly, she was still trying to get a job in, in the first few months and stuff that was very difficult and I was traveling every week. And so she was kind of left on her own. And so we got to about eight months of that and thought, okay, if this isn't going to, you know, work and, yeah. and she couldn't quite yeah. find the employment she needed, we were going to have to figure something else out. We ended up in Oklahoma of all places. Uh, her family was from that area. We said, let's meet up in Tulsa because yeah. it was kind of a combined area. So we went to Tulsa, which I had been to in the past and I had not actually stayed in Tulsa for very long other than consulting. And because of that, you're up early, you go late, you don't really see the town, right. you see the restaurants and you see it in dark. Yeah. So I really had never seen Tulsa. It turns out it's a really cool town. Cowtown, you know, it's oil and gas is a big component of it. There's a lot of really great people in Tulsa. And so she walks in after dinner one night, they're around the corner. We had been looking at some new apartments and stuff and just checking out the area, looking at costs. And of course the cost of living was tremendously lower than what yeah. we were living for in Colorado. And it was great in Colorado. I think we probably would have stayed there for a long time if things had kind of you know, worked out in, in yeah. multiple areas. She walks in two hours later, you know, out, out she comes with a job. In a oh, beautiful. At the baby's maternity ward, watching the mothers and postpartum. And she just thought that would be great. And I was like, well, I'm not doing too much else after this. So why don't we move to Oklahoma? So we went back and sold the lease and moved to Oklahoma. And from there, we stayed there for about 12 years. We had all four of our daughters in Oklahoma while we were there, four of them in four and a half years. And then Whoa. kept pumping out daughters. By the time we got through that, I was like, well, we're probably not going to have any boys. So this hey. is, uh, I, I recognize patterns. As it That's what out. my parents thought. Yeah. I have three older sisters. There you go. Oh, and, let's see. Yeah. and they had a... They had the mistake that that was a boy, which was very happy to have. At this point, you know, I wouldn't look back and say I'd ever want a boy, not because, you know, I, it just wasn't the plan for me, but my girls, yeah. I wouldn't trade the last one for a boy. I'm really, with you. I love them all to death. They're so fun. And I would never trade one of them for a boy. So it's, it is. I have one on one and I'm happy no matter what. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just the way it's just, I didn't expect to have them all that fast or I don't think we yeah. were planning that, nor did we have the old, you know, how many kids do you want to have a combo? We're like, Hey, let's just kind of, yeah. you know, my wife is cool too. She's like, let's just see what happens. I'm like, okay, we'll see what happens. So that's great. four and four and a half years is what happened. So we've spent the part there. of a decade in diapers. It's nice to be out yeah. of that finally. But in that process too, you know, we struggle together. And what I love about my wife is that she's a go-getter. She's a sergeant in arms for our family. And she's also very easygoing in her personality, always just 90% of the time. Plus she's a happy go loving person. And I, and I respect that about her quality of mindset and life. Yeah. And, and we ran into some troubles with the business. We got a little too heavy leveraged into a little too leveraged in the, you know, emotional. Which business? Physical. So this was a business that was started by a couple of guys at Oklahoma. I got involved in and got a percentage of ownership for my time and business in it to, to network and help create part of the technology. The company was called Electronetics, and it was it was a patented process and technology to be responsive and grid demand responsive to power. So we knew that there was power issues coming. We knew the EPA was taking regulations, and by 2020 they were going to reduce up to 30 percent of power generation in the in the world, which in, excuse me, our world in, Oakland, in the United mm -hmm. States, which they did, <laughs> as it turns out, which is causing a lot of problems on some of the coasts and some that are going to be even yep. more troublesome here in the coming years, but. The end result was it would create, you know, opportunities to lower demand on the grid by making the whole house responsive. It was like a router you plug into the house right. and the whole mm -hmm. house could plug into that router and then lights and television, anything that was on could be turned off. Anything that was grid sensitive could be powered down. That wouldn't be, you know, it's taking energy and you could take a yep. home or a business and automatically have it respond to the grid with the customer's consent. That's kind of important to understand because they just did this in Colorado about a month ago without the customer's consent. And that went really poorly. Yeah. Um, yeah, they tried to cool. stick everybody's thermostat at 72, even though they didn't ask for it. So that was during a peak demand time with the AC because of the heat there. But long story short, this would have solved that technology. It was grid. We were talking to AEP about putting it into beta within 6,000 homes, and we were developing that. Now, a lot of costs were involved in the technology and process, but there were some other nefarious things kind of happening that I discovered later on where the money wasn't necessarily being put into the right places. When I discovered that, I was straight, straight to a lawyer and I said, how do I get out of this? I need to indemnify yeah. myself. I don't think this is right. I don't want to be a part of it anymore. And we worked that process. So for that reason, I got out of any trouble that I didn't know about in that business. And with that came the need for a strategic bankruptcy. 
So with an eight, eight month pregnant wife, funds completely being depleted and having to go, you know, do bankruptcy in order to salvage all of this nonsense that we got ourselves into, you know, it was like 10 PM at night with a pregnant wife and she didn't realize the car was going to get repoed. Neither did I, of course, but they showed up and repoed the car. So that was fun. Um, that's, that's an experience. That was a great experience. And so we had to start over, had to figure out what to do next. I went back to the core of what I know, which was management and consulting for technology and stuff and, and started to reapply that got onto a contract back with IBM being a management consultant, but on a contract basis this time, not an employee. And that mm -hmm. kind of got the home fires. Okay. And, and I didn't have to travel for that, which was good. And that started to turn things around. But you know, the honest truth is we had to go on subsidy for a little bit. We had to get food stamps. Wow. And I, you know, that was a tough wow. time. Talk about an ego confidence killer, right? I mean, we were oh, thinking boy, business yeah. and upside and all this amazing stuff was happening in the company we were in, in investing in a lot of money. And then they weren't paying us enough because the money was running out. And so your ego, your confidence, and of course that admission of bankruptcy and failure was tough. Uh, That's it rough. was heartbreaking and it hurt our family and it hurt obviously our financial, but it hurt mindsets and hurt hearts. And there's a lot of damage done in all that. And I had to reinvent to what I was going to become, how to build my confidence back up, get back out there, you know, make money for my family. And, I'm sure uh, there's a lot of strength that came from all of that as well, for your, yeah, you and your family. Absolutely. I, I don't give credit to myself for that because I found Jesus in the midst of that. And the strength and faith of having nowhere to go but up was a moment of surrender. And in that moment of surrender, mm -hmm. so many things started to change after that as I started to take a back seat because up to that point, I was the leader and the charge <laughs> and I'm going to be out and go, go, go and do, do, do and all this nonsense. And honestly, I just crashed and burned into a wall. And after looking up, there was nowhere to go. So I said, okay, I give up. What do I do? And when I gave up that control of the business in my life, things changed dramatically in the coming years after. Beautiful. That. Beautiful. So they say you are exactly where you're supposed to be. I'm exactly where you know, I'm supposed to be. I would never are. have changed yeah. a single thing. Yeah. Yeah. When you, okay. when you, you know, you looking ahead and you see this big mountain in front of you. And then, you know, when you're past that mountain, you look back and you go, you know, that wasn't so bad. You know, yep. that was, there was some real great benefits. Of oh, and there's some fun struggles that laugh, laughable now. I mean, you know, the, the, at eight or nine, almost nine months, my wife was pregnant with our fourth and we had to go down into this hole in, in Tulsa's courthouse where there were people lined up for bankruptcy. At that point, it was far enough. It was past 2006, seven, eight, nine at that point. So that all the bankruptcies were now rolling in due wow. to the financial trouble with the mortgage industry. And so I go down there to do our final, you know, meet with the judge figure this yeah. thing out and see what we owe and what are we going to do next to get this all fixed. And we got a little pamphlet. We're sitting down there, her and I, and kids are being washed by her mother. And there was a line of like 20 people who were also in front of us. And we go into this room, we finally get our time. And it turns out there's like 20 folding desks in a, in a you know, square in this room. And there's a judge sitting at every table with a clerk and they were just processing people as fast as they could go. That's how many bankruptcies wow. we're chugging through. I don't think wow. any, many people recognize how many bankruptcies came out of that during the 2010-11 time when it all kind of you know capitulated yeah. in the market after the collapse of all the real estate yeah. stuff. So anyways, we're in there and a little bit of God's grace and all that as they surrendered the whole thing and went forward and he showed us a little bit of mercy. And when he did, he did that literally by the judge taking a five minute look, realize, reading through the summary, taking a look at us and doing something that he would not normally do or had the right to do, he could obviously, but didn't do very often. He literally wrote our entire debt off our portfolio. In a swipe of his pen, he wiped us clean. We had Beautiful. intentions to pay it back. We had a plan of action that we had to put in there, how we were gonna pay it back. And that was all setting right in front of him. And we were gonna honor that contract. And he just swiped it clean. So we walked out wow. of there with a clean bill of health and a brand new start from zero. <laughs> and and you could have been at one of, yeah, you could have been at one of those other desks another judge and had a completely different, you know, it uh, wouldn't uh, change outcome. the whole thing. Cause we were meant to yeah, be in no. front of that guy. He took pity you on were us. Meant so to I be believe that it was yeah. influenced by that. And we didn't get to say much except who we were. And we just sat there and he read it. We barely spoke. He did most of the talking and then we walked out and we were back to zero credit scores were back to 400. So we were back, you know, to zero on that. In fact, for the better part of five years, we never had a credit card after that. And we did everything by cash and remanagement partly because we were starting to be successful in business, which is another story. So we got involved in. So I, wa I want to get to that. Yeah. So what, what about, what about all the of all that? <laughs> yeah. What about, what about e-commerce sure. and how did you, how did you get into entrepreneurship? Let's go down well, that path. I always wanted to be in electronic commerce since I jumped out of college. The route I had to take through the corporate world was the way to go where you could learn and where money was being spent because there was no marketing degree. There was no internet, anything. There was nothing. Right. Like you just had to learn. 
So by the time it caught up, by the time the 99 thing happened and everybody was like, okay, now do we have to, how do we actually do e-commerce without, you know, crashing in, in portfolios and stuff? The opportunity for e-com was growing very fast. I had one of the things I had learned to do in, and was turning around our financial situation was mobile media marketing. I was actually in, you know, installing mobile apps on people's phones and so not me, but the process of yeah. installation, that sounds more like I was hacking people's phones, which I was not. I was working with an affiliate <laughs> <laughs> team. I was running mobile media traffic and I was making it on the flip on the arbitrage. So they'd pay $4 in, in affiliate commission. And I had to obviously keep my traffic profitable enough to make that profitable. So if I converted somebody for two bucks and they paid me four, I made $2 in, in gross profit. So I'm Did like, you make okay. that every month on that one or just one every time, time they installed the app, every time they downloaded, okay. installed or took an action, what's called cost per installation CPI. Um, Got it. And I was uploading spreadsheets of campaigns, literally, because there was no Facebook mm -hmm. interface. There was no mobile right. interfaces. And there was nowhere to build a campaign in our credit cards and do what you do now. There right. was, you know, we'll send you $1,000. Here's our campaigns in a spreadsheet. Let us know how it goes. So this was like very, you know, new and some of the platforms yeah, very... were just starting to be developed. And one of them was called air push. Air push was a mobile push advertising platform. And I got very good at that platform's traffic. So when we went from spreadsheets to, you know, a mobile dashboard interface, air push got a lot of traffic from me and a company out of France that I was affiliating with for mobile installations was installing mobile apps in of all places, South Africa. So uh, many of my campaigns were filtered through a France affiliate marketing channels and affiliate companies to installations and, and dating apps and other things. And one of the biggest hits was in South Africa. And so that took off to the tune of about a thousand dollars a day in profit. Wow. Uh, so we were doing, you know, hundreds of installs every day on those campaigns. And I was just getting really good at how to replicate it, but it took 300 campaign failures to see the one actually take off. Just so we're clear. Interesting. That was an uphill wow. battle too, because it was so new. It was complicated to get going technically. I just had a feeling it was going to work. Mobile was going to mm -hmm. be something. I'd been around mobile since the Sprint days. I knew mobile right. was growing and fast. I wasn't doing that in the Sprint days. I just knew mobile was growing so exponentially fast and figured out and how what to what year is this again? Is this so that would have been 2009 and 10. Yeah, 2009 and 10. Okay, 9 10. Mm -hmm. Got it. So in that process wow. of, of taking those years and, and doing that really successfully, you know, my network was opening up and credit was starting to return. And I was like getting some confidence that I could do this thing and figure out how to, you know, be an online marketer, literally. And because of that, I had made some connections and friends. And one of them literally said, hey, I just started selling on, you know, Amazon FBA. And I'm like, well, what is that? Right. And he's like, wow, well, it's, a, it's a search engine. It's product search engine. And of course, the mindset for me at that point was, well, maybe I can run traffic through it. Maybe I can do it. Let me look at it. I'm running traffic. Let's let's see if we can do that. So it's another traffic source. But it opened up a whole nother world of stuff I never really understood or really knew how to tackle just yet, which was the you know private label or brand building or literally building physical e-commerce product companies. And right. so I just started to study like I had done in the past. You know, it's who you know that gets you there and what you know that keeps you there. So at that point, I was studying anything and consuming everything I could around online marketing. In fact, one of the first courses I took was with Onyx Ngal, who's now a good friend of mine. <laughs> Text with who? Onyx Ngal is part of Learn. Oh, it's a yep, yep. training. Onyx well known in the marketing industry because he, he got started a long time ago, but it turns out I took one of his courses that helped me out greatly. We're now friends and text regularly, which I think is hilarious, but such a good guy. But anyways, learning some of that stuff and just consuming any documentation online or anything I could get my hands onto I turned into me learning about physical product and e-com and how to literally start launching products on Amazon. And because of that, I started launching the product in a retail arbitrage format, which was, could I buy it low and sell it high? And that right. led me to saying, okay, I want to learn how to do the whole FBA thing. I ended up meeting another, uh, through a mutual connection, a man named Reed Larson, who is now my partner in crime and has been with me since then for almost 10 years now, literally 10 years coming up next month, I believe. But anyways, he was on the same path of learning and doing that. And his brain power was totally different. He was, you know, speaks two languages, degreed. I think he has an MBA, if I'm not mistaken. I don't want to misquote, but I believe he does. And he was very good at the finance operations, logistics, and manufacturing side. He had a whole background mm -hmm. in that. And he didn't know anything about the online marketing or what to do for marketing products or anything. And I said, well, let me take that part of it on. I have a little inkling about how to do that. And he's like, well, let me see what I can do with the product logistics side. You, we could figure out what to sell. We'll do it. And so we launched our first brand in 2012. So after testing the market, arbitraging, et cetera, we started brand building in 2012. 
Wow. With Amazon. And we started launching products. And then I realized very fast something that I don't, I don't think everybody quite understands about Amazon. In simple terms, it is just a giant algorithm. And I know people are like, oh, sure, sure. It's a search engine. But I don't think they understand what that means. Part of what I personally discovered during that arbitrage period of time was the engine they refer to now as Amazon's A9 engine. It has new variations of it called A10. But anyways, it, it was a giant algo of, of knowledge management. And during the course of my sprint to IBM days, we were building knowledge management systems. And yep, so I was yep, like, holy yep. cow, this thing is literally like the engines we were building at IBM. And I, I believe to this day, even a portion of it may have been built by them and then re-engineered and customized to become Amazon's unique search engine for information delivery, which was basically products instead of information, mm -hmm. they customized it to deliver products. Very interesting, right? Uh, yeah. It was just a big learning engine. Literally. And its idea is I learn about who you are and everything I can about who you are. So I can present you with the right product just in time to get you right. to buy it as quickly as possible. Even Bezos said, you know, we want to sell thing, all things to all people in 30 seconds or less. Yep. So the stronger that AI has gotten, the faster they've developed people. And, and now they're literally selling 4,000 units a minute. The long story short is I kind of figured out how that engine would sort of work. I kind of figured out how they were doing the knowledge management piece of it enough for the product side. And then I just started testing products in the system to see how the engine would react. And sure enough, it was reacting as expected due to stuff that we had done in the past for programming and learning and this engine, this latent semantic search engine. And, and so I just started giving it what it wanted and the products would take off and we'd start ranking in like seven days. So we take a product right. in any category we launch as fast as we could get units and brand and private label that product and launch it to ranking sales, organic sales every day within seven days. And so that took wow. off extremely fast. Uh, so, so let me ask you a question on that. Yeah. Because again, I am from outside the industry coming sure. into e-commerce in the last few years with finance as my background. So, you know, a lot of the stuff I don't know, sure. you know, it inside and out. But from what I understand there, when you're launching brands, if you launch 10 brands and you tell me with the algorithms that you're, that you understand, no. you launch 10 brands, are they all successful or no? no. What, what percentage? More than 60% if you follow the processes we learned to get, Are into, successful. A, to get into an SOP. So yeah. the goal here is to understand the portfolio of products. We never think about anything in a one hit wonder. We Smart. don't ever believe that anything that goes out to bat, even with 80% confidence and the numbers competitive, the product in the engine will be a home run. We're looking for right. sales and velocity. We're looking for buyer intent. And some of that has to be optimized. We've gotten much, much better at that data and it is all data driven to determine what products are most in demand by the engine. Amazon yeah. sells to the customer, we sell to the engine. And that's a big difference in a lot of people's understanding of the way we do things now, yeah. because it is a process. It is a little bit of a scientific yes. process to determine the products and the data, sure but not all of them are successful. And that doesn't mean they don't sell. It just means they don't sell as well as we want them to. They don't sell right. as fast as we want them to. And the uphill battle from a competition or price point or optimization or other variables of supply chain and marketing simply say it's not worth it. So we have a phrase in our company that says, don't marry your product. Steal That's somebody else's girlfriend very instead. Smart. So there are plenty <laughs> of girlfriends that go steal. So we have a micro smart. testing investing strategy that quickly lets us determine which of the products are most in demand and then use the data and optimization process to get in line with the algorithmic expectations of that product so that we can beat our competition. Very cool. Excellent. So I, I want to ask you a question. You started out doing it on your own mm -hmm. and then with Reed. Yes. And at some point in time, you started to do it for other people. Yeah. You know, that's kind of, why? Well, how'd that happen? Well, we still do it for ourselves, for those people who are okay. out there like, well, why don't you just do this all yourself? Well, we do. We do enough for ourselves and there's more than enough products. The process we love to teach for a few people because we want to basically bring them into our network. So I don't have a course like, or a traditional program. That's not how this works. I am interested in business building for networking purposes. Yeah. Um, if you understand, uh, again, my phrase from life, right? It's not who you know, it's what you know, and who yeah. you know gets you there and what you know keeps you there. So the end result is networking is net worth. And my opportunity to coach people has really been to, to increase my network. And the aspect of that is back in 2014 to 15, I showed one guy, the first guy, how to do what we did. He had gotten put in touch with us and I showed him, you know, what the methodology was for algorithms. I said, look, if you deploy enough capital to this, it will work. Here's what I did and you can go replicate it. I'll show you how to do it. And so he took that out there and he replicated it on scale very fast. In right. fact, he hit 
400,000 a month in the first three months. And then that bumped to a million a month very fast. And by eight months out, he was doing 5 million a month. And that was wow. So he proved the whole plan, what we call our green light process, which is a trademark process for launching, developing, launching, and, and moving products into the market on scale. And we have been vertically and horizontally continuing to adapt that scale since then. We ran a couple of events to show people what we were doing in 2014 through 2016, events that were running and interpreting 400 to 800 people per an event. Um, Are you them. gonna do any going forward? No, we don't anymore. We do small group stuff just for our internal people. I've been asked to guest speak at other events, which I do. We don't run any more events for ourselves. We actually stopped the coaching component of it in 2016 and just worked on the business. Reed and I even spent, actually spent a year not even around each other very much until we got re-engaged in 2017, 2018. Then 2019 Voltage was born, this brand that I'm now talking about to do a yep. coaching component that was literally brought off the back of being approached about building a SPAC, a special purpose acquisitions company for the purpose of being an Amazon aggregator. They had known we were operators. <laughs> they knew we were very good at what we did. We got introduced to them because of that reason. And they said, hey, you know, companies are springing up. They're putting capital together. They want to buy these Amazon companies. Are you interested in doing that? And I said, well, let's talk about it in more detail. So we formed Voltage for that reason. The company is called Voltage Holdings. The Voltage Portfolios was the first division. And we started launching some of that to people who just literally referred to others in 2019. So we just started into some of the coaching with them while we were building the you know, SPAC. Long story short, we turned down the offer to build the SPAC officially in 2021. We have a lifestyle as a business and we don't have a business yeah. that drives our lifestyle. And there's a very big difference in the mindset if you can understand the two differences. Yep. The, the big component was, you know, this was gonna invert everything. We were gonna have people involved, there's money, there's all this other stuff. And as we came together, we realized two things. Number one, we did not want that lifestyle business and go back to anything yeah. that wasn't you know, keeping us focused on ourselves, our products, our brands, our direct clients, and of course our goals. And this was gonna change that. And the second thing we noticed was there was an indicator because we're in the operations, there were indicators the SPACs were going to fail if they did mm -hmm. not figure out how to correctly operate these businesses. You know, when you run a private yes. label company and when you put it onto a platform like Amazon, there are nuances and changes and sometimes daily changes you have to roll with. And if you don't have enough experience with it, you can quickly find yourself at a deficit in that system. Amazon is not your partner. They're just a tool. Like any tool, things change. Sometimes the tool is good to you and it works great. And other times it cuts your leg off. Um, you yeah. have to be careful. So the end result is, you know, there are a lot of things that could change very quickly. And because of that, we realized these aggregators were not in a place in a position to manage them correctly. And so we pulled out because we didn't want our name involved in it. And as it turns Very out, smart. that actually happened, right? And you know- It sure has. I do, it has capitulated, it has fallen. There's been bankruptcies, there have been some scandals. There's been a lot of stuff happening to change that market. And I'm kind of glad we're not caught up in it. And a lot of bad stuff that people don't even know about. Yeah, stuff I don't want to talk about. It will come out. It, it will come, come out. out. <laughs> it's not for me to tell that story. But the no. end result is, you know, that led to us being in a mentorship relationship with some folks and having a really suddenly different level of network connected through that, as you can possibly imagine. And yeah. so the concept was, look, we are building to exit. We've done that multiple times. We've been involved in other people's exits and building. And so we're like, why don't we just focus that component of the mission of this enterprise to just yeah. help people grow, you get through the growth stage that most companies fail in in five years or less. Most people think you fail in the first year, but in actuality, 80% of companies fail just under five years because they don't mm -hmm. know growth and scale. They don't lock into their market right. And because of that, they fall out of the market. So we wanted to overcome that. We can get everybody who wants to go and is tenacious going in this marketplace. It's getting them growing and scaling that's the hardest part. Keeping profitability, growth and scale to exit are the four things we stay focused on. Profitability, number one. And so through that and through scalability, that allows us that ability to grow and take them along. So we take a few people with us every month who are selected through an application process to be the right mindset, aptitude, and then have the financial prowess to run with us mm -hmm. in a year's worth of growth. So we can pull them through that next 24 months of growth and potentially into an exit. So they are set up to basically break through <laughs> the yes. reasons why most people fail or fail to grow. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I'd have to tell you, I, I know we're running late here, but I, yeah. what I have to say to you is that, you know, you, you started out where you said about college that you, you know, you weren't into it. You weren't into yeah. doing well in college. You right. flunked out a couple of times, but truthfully, you're one of the smartest guys I know. And you're, you understand this monster called Amazon and e-commerce 
like most people don't understand it. And I'm very, very impressed by all of that. But you also understand management practices and growth and personal development. And, you know, not for anything, we spoke a couple of times and we became friends pretty quickly. That's always impressive to me. And I enjoy that. And I'm, I'm pretty good at picking my friends. So I just want to ask you a quick question. Mm -hmm. What it was there a trigger in your life that you just decided or just did it just happen that I'm just going to learn everything I can about this or about that and just go 100 percent in without ever looking back? You know, <laughs> this is either a <laughs> personal character flaw or it's something that I've just learned to deal with. And that is that I, I am more willing to jump off the cliff without a parachute or anything and figure out how to build it on the way down. And I'm not afraid of that. There was a book I felt like, look, when I, when I ran into no money, when I was yeah. broke and living out of my suitcase, right, trying to get my life back together after crashing into a wall with my marriage, I, I literally don't know how to not go full throttle. It is one yeah. of the reasons why I, I circle people around me like Reed and others who pull back a little bit. My wife is one of those people. I listen to their... I listen to their feedback, I listen to their wisdom and, and encouragement, and I learn how to pull back. At the same time, I push them outside of their boundaries. Reed has now learned to stop fighting me and on these things that we jump off the cliff, and instead he grabs the backpack and jumps with me. Uh, nice. So he brings the materials, right? And so it's just a matter of finding that and just flowing with it. It's something I've just mm -hmm. am, I guess, and something I've learned to adapt on how to just change and do and just bounce off that wall and go around it, go over it, go under it because I just don't want to give up. I'm, I'm too stubborn, I guess. <laughs> well, you, you've, you've done a great job at it, man. I'm impressed. Appreciate so that. let me ask you one last question. Yes, sir. What about a book, whether it be a business book, a personal development book, any book yeah. that you would recommend to people that are listening today? Well, in all, there's actually two, and there's a reason for this. The first one was Feel the Fear and Do It Anyways by Susan Jeffries. That was one of the things that helped me kind of regain my confidence and, and restructure my thinking and do, you know, feel that fear, do it anyways, go down, go up, yes. go around, don't give up, just keep going. And that yeah. was a, a really good change when I read that book. I recommend anybody who's afraid of fear or thinking that the change or the timing isn't right, you know, just you got to feel that fear and go for it, right? You, yeah. You're going to figure it out. Tenacious and, and go-getting and agility will be the things you really make anyone successful in business long-term. And, the, and just take that step. Just take that first step. It's not going to be. It's not going to be easy. You think you can be as smart as you can, and you are not. You are going to be pretty right. dumb. I guarantee it. But you're going to work through it. The second one was Good to Great by Jim Collins. It's a little it's a out of book. date in terms of some of the case studies. However, the mindset, yes. the methodology, and the thinking of what is good and what is considered great, not by worldly standards, but by standards of practice, integrity yeah. in business and character in business is huge. And I love the way yeah. he prefaces that. And anybody who's thinking about, you know, how do I build something that's not just good, but something that could be great. It is not going to be the first attempt at your business. It is probably going to be the 15th attempt at changing something in business in order to make it go from good to great. And that's a big lift. If you can read through that book, you'll find out why I'm a hedgehog. No doubt about I, it. I, I love that book. It's a great book. Getting yeah. all the people on the, the right people on the bus and then getting them in the right seats. Right people on the bus. The right. Right. Yeah. I read that when I was building a, you know, a company with thousands of employees yep. under me yep. and uh, it really hit home. I loved it. You so know it. last question for you, my friend, mm -hmm. any final comment, any final thought that you want to leave everybody with and then we'll let them go home. <laughs> final thoughts. Well, and this is going to sound counterintuitive to this conversation, maybe a little bit. Not everyone is meant to be an entrepreneur. I would the, agree. The aspect of entrepreneurialism I have discovered has come through a lot of hard knocks. So unless you're willing to realize that you're going to knock your head, you're going to get beat up, you're going to have to be agile, you're going to yeah. have to risk going bankrupt, you're going to have to risk something, okay? Whether it's time, money, it, it, hopefully not relationships, please don't ruin relationships, but you're going to have to risk something to gain something. It does not come for yeah. free, which means not everyone is cut out to be an entrepreneur. If you think you are and you've got a side hustle or a hobby business, the only way for you to truly understand whether or not you've got the chops to be an entrepreneur is to do it all full time. Yeah. The moment you change and get out of the side hustle, you know, hobby business mindset, the chance you have to actually become a true entrepreneur and feel that fear and do it anyways, you got to get out there and push hard. That's all I got to say. It's like burning the ships behind you. Burn the ship, man. Yeah. Leave course, burn it and go. Yeah. Only no have one way to go. <laughs> if you right. remember... 
the book, The Art of War, Sun mm. Tzu, one of the things that he said when he was up against, you know, huge forces yeah. is he would place his men at, with their backs to a clip. And so there was nowhere for them to go except forward. And they always won because they had no other choice. That's Same all. idea. That's exactly Hey, Neil, this was really, really great. I got to tell you, I enjoyed learning about you. Your story is incredible. The, you know, the, the beat downs and the comebacks and the, you know, building a beautiful family and your parents moving closer to you and building those relationships. It's heartwarming and it's, it's amazing. And then now building businesses and teaching people how to build e-commerce businesses and helping them and holding their hand through it. It's not easy for people to do. Having somebody like you to help and guide them through is huge. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. And this has been great. Thank you for your time, Don. I appreciate you, brother. My pleasure. If you like this episode, please share it with people you think will enjoy it as well. Thank you for listening. And be sure to tune in next week for a brand new episode of High Voltage Business Builders. 